Welcome back to the M&M Discipleship Podcast, where we discuss what it means to be a disciple of Christ. We aim to look for God in our daily lives, be in His Word, and strive to live out the teachings of Jesus. Uh, this is Dakota Moody, and I am joined by my co-host, as always, Michael Round. Michael, how are you today? Doing good, man. Just catching up from the holidays and trying to really get back into a rhythm, which I think kind of everybody is. You know, this is the last, you know, short week. So it's it's been good, man. How about you? I'm doing very good as well. It's just that the, the holidays can really throw you for a loop sometimes. They're, they can be a blessing because you get to be, you know, around family, get some time off, get some some Sabbath rest to that point. But they can really throw you for for a loop. Um, you know, there's been different times in, in my working life that I remember like coming back from a holiday where I was gone for like a week or two. And I almost feel like I've forgotten how to do parts of my job. Like, obviously, it's not that way anymore with like ministry, but it used to be that like I would I would try to do like log into a certain thing on the computer and be like, what's that login again? Or like, you know, how do I use that system again? That's like you almost need a refresher because you've been gone for so long. And that's almost how it felt feels like with the holiday sometimes. It's just it's this rebooting, like you've been mm -hmm. living in another planet for two weeks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and, and two, like us taking a week off from the podcast, you know, you guys don't get to, to know this, but we we had to talk for an hour to catch up because we hadn't talked in a while. Oh, yeah. And so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it's it, you take a week off and and or just things change with the holidays and it feels good to get back into a comfortable rhythm. Uh, of course, you know, I've seen different memes and things and some people, they take the holidays off and they're reminded how much they hate their job. Uh, and so, you know, that, that that seriously, I've been seeing a lot of that too. Yeah. So yeah. you could look at it one of two ways. You're glad to be back because you enjoy what you do, or you're just dreading being back yeah. um, because you hate what you do. Maybe that's some time for reevaluation on what it is you're spending your life doing. I would I would think so at that point. Yeah, I, I feel <laughs> I feel blessed to have the kind of job and career where you know I anticipate coming back to it. Um, I hate that some people have to feel that way where they're like. Ugh. I agree. I agree. This is, this is one of the most Monday of Mondays, you know, whenever they're having to come back from a holiday like that, they, they felt a reprieve. And now it's like, let me put the shackles back on. Um, yeah. I'm so glad, so glad I don't have to feel that way that I, I can be as blessed with the kind of career and, and job that I do. And, and I think everybody out there, you can maybe understand that ministry has got its ups and downs. It's very different than every other job. And there's a lot of things like, for example, when my wife has been applying for jobs, I go, I'm so glad I don't have to do what you do. You know, I just yep. kind of shoot shoot a, an email to somebody with my resume attached and maybe a link to some videos of my sermons and be like, hey, I would like a job. Whereas she's got to fill out like an assessment and a personality test and all these things. And her applications take, you know, upwards of an hour sometimes to do. Um, and I'm just shooting an email to somebody saying, hey, to the elders of this congregation, hire me. Um, it's that and so many other things. It is so nice to not have to do that in ministry roles. I, I really appreciate the job that I have in that front, but to all those out there who are working those nine to fives, um, oh, we appreciate you and what you do as well. Um, cause it's, I will say, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I will say like, I think a lot of people do enjoy what, what they do. I, I mean, I'm sure a lot don't, but I, I I talk to a decent number of people and and they feel a certain kind of calling to what they do. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. There's there's a lot of folks that are are stuck in difficult difficult positions, and I, I definitely sympathize. And um, I'm sorry you have to yeah. do that. But uh, I wonder I wonder if it's a Sisyphus kind of thing, you know, rolling the rock uh, up. Yeah. Until eventually, eventually, you feel like you'd enjoy it. You know, depending yeah. on what it is, because even I'll talk about this with my mother. She's a postal worker. You know, she has mm -hmm. to. She, her job is very kind of repetitive in the fact that, you know, she's going the same route every day for the same hours and putting letters in the same mailboxes and things like that. And there's been times where she said she's really enjoyed it. Now that's of course, never the federal government is not really messing with uh, her uh, pay and things like that at being a federal employee. But you know, there's things when she really enjoyed it, but there's also times whenever she she wakes up in a cold sweat in the night because she was dreaming about doing the mail. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> and she wakes up to find it was a dream, and she was literally dreaming about doing the mail. But I will say the, any uh, that could be with any position. I've I've had bad dreams about preaching, and I'm just like, whoa! I wake up in the middle of the night. I'm so glad that wasn't true. <laughs> I have not had that yet. I'll have to wait for that. I I have had a time whenever I was, as Michael will know, I I used to be a bag boy at Ingalls, and I did have dreams about doing the carts 
like putting the putting the carts in the in the in the the the, the cart racks and then taking them out and putting them back in the store. I have done that. Um, mm. and bagging groceries, I think, as well before. But of course, whenever I was a bag boy, I tried to avoid work as much as possible because I was, you know, a terrible employee um, <laughs> during that time in my life. So different time and place. <laughs> yes, very different time and place in my life where I would do everything I can to make sure not to bag groceries, even though that was literally my job. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, but we grow up, we grow up. That's right. That's right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. We'll move. So I want to direct our attention to where we've seen God. I, and it's always funny what, you know, we have, this is our first segment and it's like, it's usually the, where we're off the rails and we're off back, the rails the most. We have to bring it back. back where have you, you know. seen God this week after having yes. these conversations? That's right. Yeah. So where have you seen God? You actually got a really interesting one this time. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, I had to get an oil change, first oil change in my in my Tacoma that I've had. So I had to bring it in for an oil change here. And I went to Toyota Beasley, which I, obviously you all know I, I've moved here in the last few months uh, to um, to the area. And so this is my first time going to this dealership, getting my oil changed here at Toyota Beasley. And I, I drove my truck in and and I thought to myself, and I don't want to talk about this too much because it's still very raw. You know, I have a lot of Texas things on my car. And so I would think that people would make comments about the dreadful thing that happened on, on, um, this Monday, the, the, the Monday. Uh, What's that dreadful thing? Huh? Uh, we're not going to talk about what that <laughs> dreadful thing was other than the fact that I wish nothing but bad things on the university and state of Washington. Um, but I figured that we would talk about, uh, <laughs> about people would talk to me about that, but no, I got out of the truck and, People wanted to talk to me about what was my license plate cover. My license plate cover uh, says Harding alum, uh, alumni. I think it says alumni. And that, that's always one thing. Alumnus, alumni. I'm pretty sure it says alumni um, on it. But uh, they talked to me about that. And it threw me for a loop because most people do not know what Harding University is. And if you're listening to this and obviously a member of the Church of, Churches of Christ, you're probably at least somewhat familiar with Harding University. But most people do not. And it's very strange when somebody talks to me about Harding. Um, and immediately, as soon as I get out, the guy who I think is running the service department there at Toyota Beasley says, did you play football at Harding University? Which tells me two things. One thing he knows about Harding University, which is a strange thing. And number two, I am a large human being. Um, and I'm la I'm glad that people think that I'm athletic enough that I could have played football at one point for, uh, for a college um, football team, even though that's not accurate in any way, shape or form, that I'm that skilled to do such a thing. But um, he, he, he talked to me about that because... He at one point had connections with people at Harding and specifically the Harding football coach and went hunting with him and everything else like that, which was one thing that kind of blew me away. But really, um, a little bit afterwards, one of the service writers that was there is a member of the Church of Christ at a, at a congregation that I had no, had no real connection with. And he had asked me whenever I came in, are, are you connected with the Churches of Christ because you went to Harding University? I said, well, yes, actually, I'm the minister at the Upstate uh, Church of Christ in Anderson. And we, you know, had a great conversation about things regarding church, faith, everything else like that, right there in the service department at Toyota Beasley. And where I saw God in this way is that I've heard people talk about this before, and and more and more of it, I think, is is correct more every time I experience it. We have infinitely more in common with people who we share a faith in Christ with than we do with anyone else, right? Like if I go to a Texas football game, we share that camaraderie of loving and supporting the Texas Longhorn football team. But we may have diametrically opposed views on just about everything else in life. And if you've ever been to Austin, Texas, you know that to be the case, <laughs> that, that most civilized people have many things not in common with many of the people there. But, but when you meet somebody who you have a shared faith with, there is you infinitely have more in common, infinitely have more to talk about than you do with anybody who has anything else in common with in your life. And that's where I see God in that way is that we see that fellowship, we see that connection, we see that bond, and that mutual bond is founded one thing. It mm -hmm. is in a faith in God. It is in our relationship with Christ Jesus. And that's just a beautiful thing, I think, when you talk about the connection, the fellowship between brothers and sisters in Christ is that we have that common bond amongst believers. And this should be something that we should continue to kind of uh, root ourselves in, is in this common connection. Yeah. 
And that's something that's that's strange in the upstate because you know there's in the whole upstate there's what like one and a half million people or whatever a large area. Um, that's something that moving to a small town and in the small town there's a lot of churches of Christ. It's very cool to encounter more people or a greater percentage of people that yeah. that share a lot of common beliefs. And so that that has been a really cool thing. And so when you encounter those people, it's it's neat and it's a reminder of how big. Our, the church is and how big our God is. Amen. Uh, so that's definitely a cool, cool way to see God in, in his church. Um, for me, uh, over the holidays, you know, I think where I saw God was just the generosity toward my girls, um, mm-hmm. that other people had. Um, it's amazing when you have kids, like you, you think people love you and, and they do, but just have kids and they, your, your family and your loved ones, they love your kids to the next level hmm. and it's just so cool to see and to have them experience that. And, uh, Mariah especially is old enough to, to get it to a certain degree. And so that was, that was pretty cool. And that's, that's where I've seen God is just the generosity of others. And we know God is, is a giver of all good gifts. And so it comes from him. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you gotta, it's, it's always been interesting to me whenever, um, people have children in a, in a church setting, because it's, it's almost like, um, uh, you, you've got a lot of different people who are constantly like, oh man, this child is so special. This child is so precious in the congregation. It's just so widespread that like a child cannot be in the congregation without multiple people loving on them because of how being parents to them. Yeah. Being parents, or grandparents, or yes. aunts and uncles. Oh yeah. Correct. And the kind of connections that you feel that you can really only find either in a family or in a church, which is in itself a yeah. family, right? You wouldn't be able to find Absolutely. that kind of connection anywhere else. Like if you brought your kids to a work event, people would go, why did they bring their kids to this work event? Like <laughs> keep them home, hire a babysitter. Like don't bring them. Church is completely different. And the yeah. kind of fellowship and love that people have for you and your family. Definitely. Definitely. It's a good point. And too, like just what it's one of the ways that I think we can appeal to our world mm-hmm. um, is that sense of community and it's, a, I mean, it's, it's, it's when we show love toward others, that's how people know we're Jesus' disciples. And so I, I think it's a way we can, we can share uh, God's love to the world. But as we think about it, as we, yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. And as we think about it, uh, we think about the scriptures, we think about our, our, the Bible. Let's go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter six. We've been working through the Sermon on the Mount and we, we get into a really exciting passage. We talked about prayer last week in general and how, we shouldn't pray publicly. We should do it privately and just ge- in general practicing our righteousness. It should be more private, not because it, it has to be private, but because we shouldn't be looking for earthly rewards. And so Jesus teaches us how to pray in Matthew chapter six, starting in verse seven, which says, when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also forgive, have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil or from the evil one. As you read uh, Jesus' model prayer there, Dakota, uh, and really his, his statement around prayer, what really sticks out to you? Well, two things really stick out to me. I think his his uh, lead up to his prayer, number one, uh, where he talks about not heaping up empty phrases like the Gentiles do, feeling like they will be heard for their many words in this way. Um, we could read that and say our prayers need to be short and sweet, which is not necessarily all that is that's being said. What I believe is being said more than anything is that prayer should be intentional. Yeah, right? prayer should be intentional. It should be focused. And it should be intentional. That doesn't mean that it has to be as short as possible, right? Um, but that it should be intentional. And our words that we use, we need not throw up a bunch of empty words, but truly trying to get to the heart of ourselves and connecting to the heart of God in that way, in our yeah. prayers. And I think that's the first thing. Um, and the second thing is this. When we see Jesus's prayer, a thing that I, I notice as well is when we, we talk about this, you want to learn how to pray. This is the prayer to model prayers afterwards, but it's not so that way you can just 
repeat this prayer all the time, as I know many people out there have probably experienced in their lives. It's just this continuous repetition of this exact prayer word for word. But the themes that are within this prayer that are important, beginning with our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Praise to God. God first focus. Begins the prayer. Then your kingdom, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven giving over ourselves and our will to God, saying, let your will be done first. First praise you, then let your will be done. Then provide for us, please God, my earthly needs, give us this day our daily bread, and then our spiritual needs, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And so this is where I think we should be modeling our prayers. God first in praise absolutely god second in this in his will being done then we come in and say please provide for my needs physically and spiritually yeah and in this way if we can pray like this we will have a strong prayer life because oftentimes we can come to prayer and our first priority is what gets put last in this prayer right father provide for me with my daily needs, with, with my right. physical needs, right? That's the first thing that comes in. It's not praise. It's not allowing his will to be done. Then it's the first thing is our physical or spiritual needs first. And when you think about who the focus is in that kind of prayer, it's on ourselves and not God. Right. But if our prayer looks like Christ, then our focus is first on God, then ourselves. Absolutely. Well, and the funny thing you know, is, is if you if you repeat this prayer over and over again, and, and not to say that this prayer isn't important, it becomes that empty phrase that he talks about the Gentiles doing. It's just another rote prayer. And, and, you know, sometimes in our prayers, we can kind of come up with phrases that are just meaningless. We, we say it without thinking yep. and, you know, I, I, I'm guilty of this. Uh, I think it, it's, it's hard not to, but yeah, I, I appreciate your, your perspective there on being intentional with our prayers and, and walking through that, I think you did a really good job of, of pointing out that Jesus is trying to give us a pattern. He says, pray then like this. It's not saying pray this prayer morning, evening, and That's right. <laughs> midday. Um, it's it's pray like this. And so your your point, yeah, I think, is really good. And one thing that, that I've really tried to adopt is when he talks specifically about forgiveness, you know, we like to ask, forgive us of our sins. But I, I really try and add that tag that he adds, that we... Mm. Forgive me as I forgive those who sinned against me. That's, right. That's a really important mindset that Christians should have, especially in our culture today. We are so, I don't know the right way to put it, but we have a hard time forgiving people. Mm -hmm. We have an easy time bearing grudges and really just kind of the polarization of our society. Uh, we, we like to have enemies, strong enemies, and we don't want to... I mean, I, I just think about some of the things Donald Trump's tweeted and talked about lately about uh, people burning in hell and and you know, having a certain delight in that. And it's like, wh where is the heart of Christ in that? And I don't mean to be political necessarily, but just like we we don't need to be trumpeting that kind of of, of rhetoric. That sh shouldn't be what we are about. Yeah, there's a lot of that, a lot of that on both sides of the aisle right now with just uh, a lot of animosity just at and and making a lot of generalizations about the other you know the yeah. other people on the other side they are the devil they are the worst they are this and that and forgiveness is nowhere in this um mm -hmm. and that's where for me it's it's hard for me to really get behind uh we'll get a little bit more controversial here get behind any particular party because it's i don't see i don't see love and forgiveness and and the things that that are 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 christ and either side of the aisle, particularly right now. And it's just, it's painful to see, but that's also what happens when the world influences everything. And that's why the kingdom that we give our allegiance to first and foremost needs to be the kingdom of God, the kingdom above. Um, Absolutely. Using him in that, in that kingdom and, and giving our allegiance to him. But I, I think there's something to um, just the idea that, yeah, we need to be looking for forgiving how can we forgive others it's very hard for us to do now because we definitely want we want justice to be done and we take it into our own hands instead of giving that to god and you see the priorities here um how how little of these of this prayer if you think about every portion of this prayer is related 
to the person praying directly. Yes, right. right? Very little. So, so little of it, right? Uh, other than give us our daily bread, forgive me as I would forgive others, mm-hmm. and, leave and, don't leave me, me, yeah. and leave me not in temptation. Most right. of the prayer is outwardly focused. And I think this is another, this is a way of testing our prayers. If most of our prayers are inwardly focused, then mm. we are inwardly focused. Right. Yeah. And thus we are not showing the heart of God. If most of our prayers are outwardly focused, as God's focus is outwardly focused, then as Christ was during his life and ministry, then we show the heart of Christ at that point. Yeah. Right. And so and even the even the selfish quote unquote selfish thing, the needed thing is uh, our daily bread. You know, it, it's it's this is so challenging too in our planning society. Give us, he asks, forgive us our daily bread. Yes. And so often we're worried and concerned with things about tomorrow, um, things that might happen, things that yeah. might not happen. And so yeah. I I think that there's that's another attitude shift. It's here now, the present, what I need today. Yeah. It doesn't say fill up my 401k. It says, yeah, oh yeah. This day, my daily bread. Our focus is so much on wanting the bigger and best and the biggest. And, you know, uh, Father, please provide for me that $500,000 house instead of the $250,000 house. Let me, Father, let yeah. me provide for us a new car and not, mm-hmm. and not help us to repair our current car. Things like that. It's, yeah. Uh, I think the focus shift that's even here. Within this, it's about giving me what I need, yes, giving me forgiveness, and leading me not into temptation, not into temptation, not the Absolutely. biggest things that we may want or wish for, but where is our focus truly? It should be outward first, and even when it is in ourselves, it isn't on luxuries, our comforts. It's about mm. what we need. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, that's a really good passage to talk about, and I'm sure we could talk a lot longer about it. Uh, two Absolutely. preachers talking about the Lord's Prayer, I'm sure we could go on forever. There's a lot of uh, things seemingly. we could talk about that. But I think we should probably focus on our final segment, which is what are we reading this week? So, uh, yes. Michael, what, what have you been reading this week? So toward the the end of, of last month, I finished up The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People and really enjoyed that. He He, he begins with this whole concept with the book, he starts with the inside and you should focus on the inside of what's within you, your character and all that. And then he, he, he moves to the outward and then he comes back to inside out again toward the end of the book. But I just want to share one quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson that he shared toward the end. He says, uh, Emerson says that which we persist in doing becomes easier. Not that the nature of the task has changed, but our ability to do has increased. And I think this is an appropriate Quote, on a day we talk about prayer or just any kind of spiritual discipline or any habit in general, it's not that it gets any easier the more you do it. It's that your abilities increase. And I think this is a, a very uh, Christian principle as well, that we we grow in um, Bible reading, we grow in prayer, we grow in, in good works and service and all of these things. And those things become easier. They become second nature. And so I think it's something that we should strive for. Uh, so it makes sense that a, in a book that's about effectiveness and being an effective person, um, that that book had a lot to do with you know how we become an effective Christian when you apply those things in, and so practicing what we're doing and, and recognizing that we will get better at what we do. Uh, so that's that's what I'm reading. What about you, man? Well, I think that's a kind of a perfect segue into what I was uh, going to talk about because um, I've been continuing in my reading of the Lost Art of Disciple Making, and uh, in chapter, uh, I believe this is either four or five, uh, chapter four, um, the uh, the chapter's called "People Helping People." People help people, and talk about discipling. It has to be person to person. There's two different examples, and the second one's the really the one I think is going to connect with yours. Two different examples he gives is this. He talked about how he and a neighbor of his both used the same lawn care service to get the same kind of lawn. The okay. difference was is that um, the person, his neighbor, applied this uh, the standard watering system, which automatically watered the lawn um, underneath the, the ground and gave the same amount of water to all the water in the yard, or to all the lawn in the yard. And on uh, contrary to that, he himself, um, the way he watered his yard was his wife went out with a garden hose and watered the yard. Well, a year later, whose yard do you think 
would be in the best shape. Well, you'd probably think it's the person that had the automated water system because you knew they'd always get water, they'd always get a consistent amount of water, and it would always work that way. But you'd be wrong. And the reason mm. for this was the person with the automatic water system, all the ground, all the, the 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 lawn got the same amount of water. And you'd think that made consistency, um, made it better because of that consistency. But actually, certain parts of the lawn needed more water. Some of the parts of the lawn needed less water. And so because of this, the lawn ended up not working out very well because the parts that needed more and the parts that needed less did not get what they actually needed. The lawn wow. that ended up working the best was the one that was taken by that was watered by a person that saw, oh, that that part of the ground is um, needing more water. Let me add some water to that one. That one needs less water. Let me not add some to that. And it was that personal care. And people, especially in discipling, need that same kind of uh, framework because there's not just a standard way to disciple and minister to all people. Certain people need more. Certain people need less. And certain people need different strategies and ways in which to work with them. And so this is very important in uh, what we're thinking about as regards regarding discipling other people, ministering to other people. But the second example is, I think, even more important and fits exactly into what you're talking about, um, which he, he's talking about the fact that many people who are within faith have lost the ability to be able to truly be in God's word often and know how to read mm -hmm. it and use it effectively. And he talked about this when they were in Florida, they were in uh, this the orange country. I mean, orange growing country. They were driving to the hotel and there was just miles of orange groves everywhere. And they get to the hotel and they get inside and they stay the night. And the next morning they go up for breakfast. And of course, the guy desires orange juice because that's all he's seen is all these oranges and orange trees. Well, he asks for orange juice and the lady comes back and says, I'm sorry, our machine's down to be able to make this orange juice. We can't make orange juice. For you so you can't have orange juice and what he says is there are millions of oranges around and yet the people who are there have become so dependent upon this machine to make their orange juice that they can't just get like a simple um yep. well i don't know what that'd be a juicer um yeah. to, to be able to create this juice on their own even there's plenty of opportunities around this and he talks about this as regards the bible because when people have the bible in america especially we have the Bible everywhere. We have the Bible on our phones. Mm. We probably own multiple Bibles within our houses and within our, our places of study. We've got the Bible everywhere, but people don't know how to use the Bible. And so the only time whenever they actually maybe get uh, their spiritual feeding, get their juice in this way, is by the preacher on a Sunday morning preaching to them. That's the only time whenever they receive the Word. And so for us to be able to help people, disciple people in the Word, we have to retrain them how to create the juice themselves, right? Mm. In that way, we need to be able to help them on a person to person basis, be able to be able to feed themselves, create mm. their own juice in this way, be able to read their word on their own without need for help. And in so doing, they can finally grow into the people they are called to be to then help others be able to do mm. the same. Mm, that's a really good one. So the moral of the story is go rob orange groves and uh, make your own juice. <laughs> <laughs> that's right <laughs> no that's a really i love that illustration though but like yeah. it's 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 that um an embarrassment of riches yeah and you know i think about this in sports and i know we're running out of time you know thinking about it but like sometimes when when a team has too much talent they don't know how to work together and mm. you know we, we just we lose we're oversaturated with the bible sometimes we lose the the beauty of it um we we lose the desire for it absolutely yeah, that's um, right. The people, people hiding the Bible in caves in China, and they know how to read the Word of yes. God because because they thirst after it, and they they, and keep they memorize it in their mind, it. and they keep it in their hearts, and they're in it as much as they can be, which is so limited amount of time as they can be, but they get everything out of it. Whereas we have so much opportunities, yet we use it so little. Absolutely, absolutely. So one thing we appreciate you guys joining us today. This is an opportunity where you can uh, help learn how to get into the Word and be looking for God. And so we appreciate you joining us today. Until next time, let's look for God in our daily lives, learn from His Word, and live out His teachings.